Hi, and welcome to Computer Vision lecture number nine at the University of Tübingen. This is a lecture that I have been looking forward to for a while, as it is about a topic, coordinate-based neural networks or implicit shape representations that my group has worked a lot on. And in fact, we have proposed one of the first models in this area called occupancy networks that has established an entire field and sparked by now within maybe one or two years already more than 1000 follow-up works. This lecture is subdivided into four units. In the first unit, we are going to cover basic implicit neural representations for shape, appearance and motion. In the second unit, we'll talk about differentiable volumetric rendering, which allows for training these representations from images alone without requiring 3D supervisions. In unit number three, we are going to cover a neural radiance field or NERF in short, a very popular method that also uses these implicit network ideas um, but with the primary goal of novel view synthesis. And in unit number four, we're going to cover generative versions of these models that allow for building um, representations of the worlds that we can sample from in 3D. Now let's get started with implicit neural representations. This is a slide that I've shown you before. This is a traditional 3D reconstruction pipeline where the input is a set of images. We infer the camera poses, for instance, using bundle adjustment. Then we establish dense correspondences, um, stereo, binocular stereo or multi-view stereo resulting in depth maps. We are fusing these depth maps into a more coherent global 3D reconstruction of the scene. Now this is all fine, but despite some parts of this pipeline might utilize learning, we haven't used learning extensively. And in particular, we haven't answered the question if it's possible to directly go from just one or multiple images, it's possible even from one image for a human, to a complete 3D reconstruction of an object. And that's the question that I want to start with. Can we learn 3D reconstruction from data? This is a heavily machine learning um, or data driven paradigm. Learning requires data, but luckily over the last 10 years or so, a lot of 3D data sets have become publicly available. For example, through scanning techniques such as active lighting systems, active light scanning systems that we have discussed in the previous lecture. Or this is another uh, data set that has been scanned. Um, and that that has happened for both on the object level, as well as at the room level. Or um, data sets that are comprised of CAD models that have been designed by artists. And there's a lot of these CAD models now available online um, free for download and have been collected in the so-called uh, ShapeNet data set. So there's a data set called ScanNet and there's a data set called ShapeNet. ScanNet is a data set that has a lot of 3D scans obtained with a scanner and ShapeNet is a data set that's a collection, a taxonomy of 3D CAD models that can be used for um, uh, learning. And then more recently, this is an example from the Matterport data set. There ha uh, has been also have been also attempt to not just reconstruct single rooms, but entire buildings. And this, of course, has a lot of um, immediate applications. Um, so can we make use of this data? Now, if we want to build a model that learns to predict shapes directly from one or multiple input images, 
we have to of course answer what is a good output representation. The input representation is pretty clear. It could be in the simplest case, just a single 2D image that gets processed with a standard 2D convolutional networks as we have introduced it in the deep learning lecture. So the input representation is a pixel matrix and we have a 2D confident encoder here. But what should be the decoder? And in particular, what is a good output representation? There's a couple of output representations that people have considered, starting with the seminal work from Maturana et al. and IRIS 2015, where um, they have looked at the most simple extension of pixel-based representation, which is a voxel-based representation. A voxel is a 3D equivalent of a pixel. It's basically, so here's a 2D, this is, a, this is a, the pixel version here on top. This is just always a 2D illustration to better see what this representation is like with free space. So it's inside, this is gray and outside uh, free space is white. And this is the actual 3D representation where we have these gray voxels that are filled solid. This is indicating what's inside and then the free space that's outside. You can see these, these voxels are 3D equivalents, little cubes of 2D pixels. So it's a simple discretization. It's a discretization of the continuous 3D world that we live in or the 3D space that we want to reconstruct into a regular 3D grid as illustrated here. And it's easy to process with neural networks because we can apply the same convolutional neural networks that we have just extend to 3D. Right? Instead of 2D kernels, we have 3D kernels now. And of course, also the channel dimensions. So effectively, we would have 4D kernels. And um, the problem with this representation or the major difficulty with this representation that we have also played with is even if you use very special data adaptive data structures such as OCK trees, you still suffer from um, very large memory growth, which in the naive case is cubic, but even with these special data structures is a problem. So this effectively limits the resolution of what we can output to something very blocky, maybe a little bit larger than this. This is very small resolution, but typically not exceeding 256 to the power of three voxels which is still pretty coarse and you can still see the artifacts. And then another downside of this representation is that it introduces an, a Manhattan world bias, right? So you have these, these voxels, they have to be oriented in some way because we are using these voxels as these most simple primitives in our representation. And so we have to define the coordinate system that orients the voxels and that coordinate system introduces a bias. So we always have we can model flat surface only in the canonical directions, but not 45 degree oriented with respect to the canonical directions. Another representation that has been used in the literature and has been popularized by Fanadal at CVPR 2017 is a point sets. Points are a discretization of, surf of the surface into 3D points. So this is not a volumetric representation, but that's directly a representation of the surface. You can see a 2D example here and a 3D example here. The difficulty with this representation is that it doesn't model connectivity or topology. We don't get a, a surface out of this representation immediately, but we have to extract it using a post-processing algorithm such as Poisson surface reconstruction that is not directly taken into account when we train these models. Furthermore, these models are typically limited in the number of points that they can represent. And they um, typically require a global shape description as input that also limits the flexibility of what these models can output. And typically this is um, um, possible only at the object level and not at the scene level. And then finally, in 2018, mesh-based output representations became popular. Meshes are very natural. They are used ubiquitously, for example, in, in computer graphics and in games, in movies. Um, 
And they are also discretizations, like point sets and voxels, but here they discretize, meshes discretize the 3D space into vertices and faces. Right? So here we have a 2D visualization, it's basically just a line segment. And here we have a 3D version, which is a mesh. And that's actually an output of this method here called AtlasNet. Now the problem that arises through this discretization here in the case of meshes is that meshes are not very nice output representations to predict with a neural network due to their complicated structure. It's very simple to create self-intersections and it's very hard for the network to learn to not produce self-intersecting surfaces um, as shown here. There's two primary paradigms. One is to predict little surface patches and stitch them together as AtlasNet does. The other is if we know something about the shape that we want to represent, then we can build a class template, a class specific template, such as a, a mesh of a, a human face or a human body or an animal body or whatever. So if we know what class we want to reconstruct, then we can utilize these templates and instead of predicting local surface patches that have this problem with non-water tightness and self-intersections, we um, uh, then deform the vertices of this template. But of course, this only works for well-behaved cases. If we don't change, want to change the topology, if we don't want to create holes, and if we know already the class that we want to reconstruct. So it's limiting the applicability and it's not as generic as the other representations. Now, what we try to do in our CVPR 2019 work is to go away from these discretized representations um, and instead represent the surface implicitly. And I will tell you in a second what that means. The advantage of this is that this allows for representing arbitrary topology and in theory, at least, an arbitrary resolution using a very low memory footprint. And it's not restricted to any specific class template like in the mesh case. So the key idea is to not represent the 3D shape explicitly, but instead to consider it, or to consider more specifically, to consider the surface implicitly as the decision boundary of a nonlinear classifier. Here's a 2D example, in this case with a linear classifier, you can think of, for example, a support vector machine or a linear neural network. In practice, of course, we're gonna use linear uh, neural networks that tries to separate two classes. The red points are the points inside the object, which take occupancy value one, and the blue points are outside the object, which take occupancy value zero. And if we want to train a classification model, or if we have trained a classification model, then we can extract the decision boundary, right? That most optimally separates inside from outside points. And this decision boundary is what we consider the surface. So the surface is represented implicitly. It's represented implicitly by the parameters of this model and it's represented implicitly because it needs to be extracted in a post-processing step because the only thing that we have is access to this classifier that separates inside from outside. Um, here at the bottom, you can see a 3D example, in this case with a non-linear decision boundary. We can see this object is a bench and there is these red points that are sampled inside the bench and the blue points which are sampled outside the bench. And we want to train a classifier that most optimally separates the blue from the red points. And we do this by um, repeatedly sampling points from the volume for which we know if they are inside or outside. And we can sample points closer to the surface to become more precise, for example. And then we're refining the weights of our neural network of our classifier such that the decision boundary becomes closer and closer to the decision boundary we like to have. So of course this requires full supervision 3D. We require the ability to for every surface, for every 3D point 
to query if that point is inside or outside the shape. So we require a watertight mesh in order to generate the ground truth. To repeat, instead of representing the 3D shape explicitly, we consider the surface, the surface of the object implicitly as the decision boundary of a nonlinear classifier. And we call that classifier an occupancy network, F theta, because it's a neural network with parameters theta that maps from a 3D location. This is just three coordinates. This is the point location plus some condition that could be an encoding of an input image or a point cloud. This is representing the structure of the 3D shape that we want to model. So we need to, of course, condition on something in order to be able to represent multiple different shapes. So this is where the condition comes in. And the output of this neural network is just an occupancy probability that's between zero and one, right? Neural networks um, can predict probabilities um, by a simple sigmoid or uh, a binary softmax activation. If the network predicts one, then it's very likely that this point is a point that's inside the object. If it predicts zero, it's very likely this point is outside the object. And we want this classifier to be as confident for most of the points and as correct for most of the points as possible. Um, some remarks. The function f theta models an occupancy field. Here we have really a continuous space that we consider. So this function here models a, a field in a mathematical sense. And it's also possible to model not just the occupancy probability, but also the sign distance. As we've seen in the previous lecture, the sign distance is useful. It allows, for example, to directly um, find the surface from a point close to the surface by just following the gradient um, for as long as, as the sign distance value, as the magnitude of the sign distance value. And this has also been proposed by related work. Um, but the model is very similar, except that we change the occupancy probability output with a SDF output. In this, in the context of this lecture, however, we're going to stick with the simpler model, which is just predicting occupancies. Now, in order to implement this model, we need to define this neural network architecture F, F theta. So what we do here is a very simple multi-layer. We use a very simple multi-layer perceptron, which is a residual network composed of five blocks. This is a repetition of five of these yellow blocks where we have an encoder here. This is another neural network, for example, a 2D convolutional network that takes an image or a point encoding network that takes a point set or a voxel 3D convolutional network. And that produces a fixed length vector, which is the condition. Let's say this is a 128 dimensional vector. And then this condition is injected at multiple locations into this residual network using so-called conditional batch normalization. But you can also do other conditioning techniques. You can apply other things like um, concatenating these vectors or adding these vectors. And all of them work to some degree. And then the other thing that's the input to this residual network is a set of 3D points. We not just only pass a single 3D point, but we pass directly a batch of T in the order of 2000 points, because it's of course more efficient to process more of these points in parallel, to process the entire batch in parallel on the GPU. So we pass an entire batch of these points to this network. That's why they have a T times three for X, Y, Z dimensional input. And the output is for each of these T points, the occupancy probability. So a very simple model. How do we train this model? Well, it's a simple classification task. So we can train it with standard binary cross entropy. And that's what we do. So for all of the K points, we compute the binary cross entropy between the model prediction for that point 
and the true occupancy, which is zero or one for that particular point. And that's always given this input condition Z. This is the condition on the image. We can also build a variational occupancy encoder. And that's simply the variational autoencoder model that we have talked about in the deep learning lecture applied to this idea of implicit shape representations, where we have now, in addition to the reconstruction term, a KL term, a kullback leibler divergence term between some prior and the uh, encoder distribution Q psi. So we need another encoder that goes from the point set to uh, the latent code. Right. Okay. Now, because this is an implicit model, we don't get a mesh out directly. So we have to e extract the mesh from this implicit representation. And how do we do this? We do this using a technique that we call multi-resolution isosurface extraction, in short, MISA, which it incrementally builds an OCK tree by querying the occupancy network. So we start with a grid, let's say a four by four grid. In practice, of course, we use a more fine grained grid and we query the occupancy network. So this is, you should imagine this in 3D, but for purpose of easy visualization, I've plotted in 2D here. So we query these 3D locations on that grid and we observe that this point is inside the object and this point is outside the object, given the object representation, given the parameterization of our neural network. For the, that particular setting of parameters and input condition, this is the shape, the boundary, the surface of the object. Therefore, this point will result in a, will be classified positive and the other points will be classified negative. Then we look at all the adjacent cells that are adjacent to any point that's inside and points that are outside, that transition from points inside to points outside, because the surface must lie inside these cells. And we're subdividing these cells simply. And then we are querying these subdivided unknown locations. And we find that these points here are inside and the other points are outside. And we can repeat this process n times and get finer and finer until we reach um, the level of granularity that we want. And in the end, we can run the margin cubes algorithm, as discussed in the last lecture, to extract the surface, to extract a triangular mesh um, from this indicator grid. And the whole process requires about one to three seconds, depending on the size of the scene. So it's not super fast, but it's not super slow either. And the main time requirement of this process is because we have to query this neural network many times, but we do it in a clever way. We don't do it naively and densely at the same resolution, but we do it close to the surface. We do it in a, this hierarchical course to find manner. Here are some results. This is the input to the image. And on the right, you see some baselines, a voxel based approach, a point set generating network, um, a mesh generation network, and the output of our method um, meshed to a 3D mesh. And you can see that it is very simple for these implicit representations because we don't model the surface explicitly to handle arbitrary topologies and produce very nice and smooth surfaces. Here you can see a different um, input condition. This is a point cloud um, shape reconstruction task where the input is a sparse and noisy point cloud and the output is a 3D shape. And on the left, the ground truth. And we can similarly apply this to a voxel super resolution task where the input is a coarse voxel grid and we're trying to do super resolution of this voxel grid. You can see the output of our method on the right. 
what we show here is a visualization of latent space interpolations of our generative model of this variational autoencoder type model, which is able, given a set of CAD models as input to generate new shape, new shapes from the underlying shape distribution and to interpolate between shapes, as you can see here. Okay, so let's move on. This was all about shapes, representing shapes, but can we also represent appearance with this type of implicit model idea? And it's actually quite straightforward to extend these ideas to color. What we did in this work, it's called Learning Implicit Surface Light Fields that we published at 3DV in 2020, is to try to model view dependent appearance by conditioning a neural network on an input image, just as before, but also on some 3D geometry that could be a cut model that represents this object in the image, or there could be a shape that's predicted using an occupancy network from that image. And we show results for both cases. And what we wanna do then is we wanna train this model using um, uh, different view conditions such that afterwards we can not only change the viewpoint, but we can also manipulate the illumination as you see here. You can see that the shading and the shadows um, that are on this object change depending on where the light source location is. Here's the rendering equation that we are familiar with. We're not using the rendering equation directly, but we are modeling a conditional surface light field. So we're not modeling the material, the BRDF, and um, we are um, assuming a point light source, which means that this integral here goes away. So what we do instead is we model a function that maps from a 3D point location and a viewing direction V and a light location L. These are these three quantities to a 3D color value. That's called a surface light field. For every point on the surface, given any possible view direction and light direction, we wanna know what the color is that this would produce when I render this into the image. So here's an overview of the model. Um, the image encoder is the same as before. We take an input image and encode this into a latent vector C. And then we have an input shape that's here in this case encoded using a geometry encoder into a, a global shape code S. And then we can take any point on the surface of this object and we query first an appearance field that gives us a feature vector for the appearance and then this lighting model that conditions also on the light setting and the view direction to produce the color of the pixel that this 3D point renders to. And we're minimizing the reconstruction loss between this predicted image and the true image. This is trained on a data set of chairs with materials um, that we render using physically based light transport. Here are some results. This is with ground truth geometry as input. Here's the input image. On the right, you can see a 2D baseline that tries to transfer, that learns to transfer the appearance of that 2D image to any render 2D image of the object. And that doesn't work very well, of course. And it's not very consistent, but because we model directly in 3D, our results are much more consistent. And in particular, what you can see here is that it is capable of modeling specular highlights as well as also shadows. And this also works with inferred geometry. So here's an input image. This is the geometry that has been inferred with an occupancy network. And then this is the, um, the color, the view dependent color and the elimination condi uh, conditioned color that we produce. This is, all, this is all produced, this output is entirely produced from a single 2D RGB image. That's, that's quite remarkable that you can learn to produce such an output from this type of image. However, this model has only been trained on chairs. <laughs>
So it cannot produce anything, it cannot predict anything else than shares. And of course, if you go to an object that's a little bit further from the data distribution, from the distribution of shares that have been seen during training, it will not work uh, very well. So this was about appearance. Can we also represent motion? The naive way of representing 3D motion is to simply extend this idea of occupancy networks to 4D. But unfortunately, this is hard due to the curse of dimensionality. It is hard to represent a complicated 4D function and the shape evolving over time is a complicated 4D function because it's discontinuous at the surface boundary. So it's really hard to represent this in 4D. And the additional difficulty is that there's much less data sets with ground truth inside outside points with watertight meshes available for this type of 4D task. So we have less data and we have a, a higher capacity model and a more difficult um, optimization problem, which makes it very hard. Therefore, what we do instead is to represent the shape, only the shape at a particular time instance, let's say t equals zero without losing generality, using a 3D occupancy network. So this is what we have done before already. And then we represent the motion by a temporally and spatially continuous vector field as illustrated here. Now, this is still a 4D function that we have to predict but in contrast to the shape evolving over time, this is a much more continuous object because this vector field can be continuous over the entire duration of the sequence. As illustrated here, it's very continuous. You can see these little arrows are changing very continuously both in space and time. And therefore, it's much easier for the model to learn and we can use um, lower capacity models to accommodate the fact that we have less data available for training. The relationship now between the 3D trajectory or 3D location S and the velocity is of course given by a simple ordinary differential equation which tells us well the gradient of the location is the velocity. That's what we know from high school physics. Now because we have such a simple relationship as an ODE and because ODEs are differentiable, this has been popularized or repopularized in a 2018 NeurIPS uh, best paper award, we can use this ODE inside our model and backpropagate gradients through it. And this is the model. So what we try to do is we try to, given ground truth shapes at discrete time instances, um, for which we know inside and outside, we can take any point here and warp it through that ODE that's predicted by the velocity field, or that's conditioned on this velocity field or implied by this velocity field um, that itself is conditioned on the input. So we can warp that point to the location at time equals zero. You can see how the space deforms in the background. And then we can try to make the occupancy network predict the uh, class, class label of that particular point correctly. In this case, it's an inside object point. So it should make the occupancy network predict one for this particular point. Now this is all end-to-end -end learnable because the ODE is, it doesn't have any parameters, but it's differentiable. So we can backpropagate the gradients through this entire process to both the parameters theta of the occupancy network and the parameters of the velocity network. Okay. And the really nice thing about this is that we, we don't need any correspondences, which are typically required for such kind of tasks, but the correspondences are implicitly established by our model and they are correct. So here you can see some inputs, some frames of the inputs. This is a point cloud completion task. And at the bottom, you can see the output and you can see in color which points correspond to which points. And you can see that the color is correctly predicted the same for the same object parts. Here's a little video.
Again, this is point cloud completion results. The input is a very sparse and noisy point cloud. And on the right, you can see the result of this naive occupancy network in 4D and this occupancy flow model. And you can see that it's much more expressive. Um, and it does suffer much less from this course of dimensionality than the occupancy network 4D approach. We've talked about representing shape. We've talked about representing appearance and motion. But all of these results that we've seen were on relatively small scale scenes, in particular objects, single objects, reconstructing single objects. And so we're wondering, well, can we also use this output representation as a representation to predict larger scale scenes, entire rooms, let's say, or entire buildings, even like in the case of the Matterport dataset. There is an important limitation of these implicit neural representations as we have seen them so far. There is actually two important limitations. The first limitation is that what we have done so far is to predict a global latent code as a input X, that's the image or a point cloud or the voxel grid. And we have a 1D encoder that predicts a fixed dimensional latent code for that image. And that's the condition of the occupancy network of the MLP. These are the features. Now this is a, let's say 128 dimensional vector. And it's very difficult to represent uh, the entire distribution of possible 3D scenes in such a vector. It's, it's kind of possible to represent the distribution over objects because the shape variability is not as large, but for scenes with multiple objects inside, the um, uh, type of outputs that we can expect grows exponentially because there's any possible object at any possible location in any possible combination. And that makes it really hard. So because there is no local information in this global code, this 128 dimensional vector has to represent the entire scene. It's very hard. And typically it leads to very smooth geometry as we'll see on the next slide. The other limitation is that this architecture is very limited by its nature. It's a fully connected architecture, a fully connected network that for example, doesn't exploit translation equivariance such as we exploit it on a regular basis when we deal with images in our convolutional neural networks. And we know that this translation equivalence is crucial for modeling images or also 3D scenes with voxel grids. But this is not at all captured here in this type of model. And this is what it looks like if we apply this implicit occupancy network on, um, well, still relatively simple, but you know, scenes that are more complex than single objects. On the right, you see the ground truth. On the left, you see the prediction. This is a model that has been trained for a very long time, uh, much longer than for the single object prediction tasks. And it's just not able to get the objects right. It actually gets the ground plane right because the ground plane is something that looks similar in all the scene scenes, but it doesn't get any of the objects close to, even close to what they actually should look like. So what we are trying to do in, in this work that we published at ECCV 2020 called Convolutional Occupancy Networks is to combine the merits of both approach, implicit modeling and convolutional networks into one approach to remedy the two limitations that we've seen previously. The task that we consider here is the point cloud based shape completion task. And what we do is we first encode the 3D points locally using a point net encoder. So we take all the points that are inside such a volume and project and, and encode those using a, a neural network that produces a feature for just those points at that location on the ground plane, let's say. This is the ground plane here. 
And we do this for all the points on the ground plane. So we, we use a discrete structure on the ground that we establish, a discrete pixel grid. And then we compute features for each of these pixels on the ground plane based on the points that fall inside this tube. Um, and then we have a 2D convolutional network that runs on this image. This is now an image on the ground plane. It's a simple unit that aggregates features on that image and that exploits now equivariance. And then we can query each of these features by doing bilinear interpolation of the features on the ground plane. So we, if we want to query the occupancy state of that 3D point, we are querying uh, these features by bilinearly interpolating them and inputting the bilinearly interpolated features and the location um, to the occupancy network that predicts the class inside outside. Now, because we have already a lot of weights in this 2D unit, this occupancy network can be more shallow than before. So this readout network is much more shallow and we exploit um, the convolutional property equivariance. So we have exploited locality by just looking at local, a local neighborhood and the convolutional equivariance property. There's multiple ways of doing that. We can just project to a single plane. We can project to three canonical planes here. These are the planes aligned with the X, Y, and C axis of the coordinate system. And then we query all of these features as input condition to the occupancy network. Or we can do it directly in, in a 3D volume where now we have to use a little bit of coarser representation of the volume compared to these planes here, which are 2D. Now here we have a 3D grid. So instead of maybe 128 by 128, we can just use 32 by 32 by 32. But we use the same principle. We aggregate information just within local cells. So this is the cell center and we aggregate information from all the points that are surrounding, that are in, falling inside that cell <clears throat> locally. And then to query to obtain the features, we use trilinear interpolation of these features that have been computed using a 3D unit architecture on that voxel grid. So we query these features now using trilinear interpolation because we are in 3D, but then we do the same thing. We have a shallow occupancy network as a readout that predicts the class conditioned on these interpolated features. And we can do that, of course, for any continuous location in that volume. Uh, for for the na for a point that's in the vicinity but still in the same cell, these features of course will look different, and that's what the network, both this network and this network together, because they are jointly trained, can exploit to learn robust um, scene shape representations. So here's a comparison again. This is the naive occupancy network, and at the bottom is the convolutional occupancy network that, in contrast to this, produces a localized feature representation that can be processed using a convolutional network and then we query the features using interpolation as input to this more shallow readout MLP. In comparison to the occupancy networks this leads to much higher accuracy and also faster convergence. So we have here the input for a point cloud rep uh, reconstruction and a uh, a voxel reconstruction task or voxel super resolution task. This is the result for occupancy networks uh, on this more complex shape categories. And this is the output of the convolutional occupancy network that exploits locality and equivariance. More importantly, this not only leads to better accuracy and faster convergence, but it also allows for representing scenes. Here we have a comparison on synthetic rooms, you can see compared to the naive occupancy network, our reconstructions are much more precise. And even when training only on synthetic rooms, we can apply this model on real scans. So this is a model has been trained on synthetic rooms, where we have applied it then on real scans from a Kinect structured light sensor. This is on the ScanNet data set. And the results, while not perfect, they look plausible, at least much more plausible than the results of the naive occupancy network. And then finally, we can also take this model and extend it to a fully convolutional model and apply it to really big scenes like the Matterport dataset, which contains scenes of entire buildings with multiple rooms. 
And this doesn't fit in GPU memory, but because this model is fully convolutional, we can, with overlapping receptive fields, apply it in sliding window fashion in chunks, and we can train it also on these chunks. We can then sub, um, subsequently process multiple or iteratively process multiple of these chunks in a sliding window fashion, just like a sliding window object detector, and um, produce very large scale reconstructions as shown here. This is also illustrated here in this video. This is one example of the Matterport 3D reconstruction. And this is another example from Matterport. 